A big warm-hearted welcome to all the viewers watching Soul to Soul talk show. In the previous episode, we started this journey with Charlie Hogg, brother Charlie Hogg from Australia, and we will be continuing this journey in this episode too with him. A big welcome to you, brother. A pleasure you, to have Sarina. you with us. Thank you. <laughs> in this episode, we'll see how spirituality can help us uh, in our relationships, and if uh, it can answer the questions to the issues that we, you know, are it, that we face in our relationships, uh, brother. How do you define a relationship in a spiritual angle, from a, as a spiritual person? <laughs> Actually, Shrinya, you know, I, in my experience, when you talk to people and you ask people what's the most important thing in their life, they will always come back to relationships. And um, hmm. really, virtually 90% of people will say that it's the fabric of a quality life. Hmm. And I think that we're living in a time now, a culture, where people, I think, because we're a bit disconnected from my true self, um, we don't receive love from ourselves very much, then we're very dependent on others. So if others are giving it to me, I'm fine. But if they're not, then hmm. very quickly people feel very hurt, very resentful, and start the game of blame. Hmm. And I think it's one of the great things that's helped me on my spiritual journey is to, you know, take full responsibility for how I feel. Hmm. Because I feel these days, the way I define a relationship from a spiritual perspective is that all relationships do is trigger what is already sitting inside of me. You know, when you come in touch with somebody some pull out your feelings of a lot of love and a lot of warmth hmm. and a lot of respect, but others trigger other feelings of a little bit of anger or hurt or whatever. But often when we're not really spiritually aware, we always blame you hmm. for the way I feel. But I think someone who has a, a spiritual fabric in their thinking doesn't blame you, but realizes that you're like an instrument to open up what's already sitting inside of me. And I would mm. say on the spiritual journey that other people help me know who I am. Because every feeling that comes in my mind, if it's a feeling of deep love or deep hurt or a lot of anger, is actually my feeling. And I think a truly spiritual person takes full responsibility for their feelings and doesn't project it onto others. So if these feelings that are emanating from you because of others, if they are negative, then how do you change them? How do you transform them? Well, I think that, you know, when I start to realize that they're my feelings, then mm. um, this is the spiritual journey really is to take responsibility for them. And I think, you know, start to work on the quality of my feelings inside because I read some research once which was saying that whenever you connect with another person, mm. like you and I are doing at the moment, <coughs> you know the impact of language of what you say is only 10 to 15 percent of mm. the impact of relationship. 80 to 90 percent is nonverbal, is the feelings and the expressions. You know the modern language is body language. Mm. And so it's like if I, if you get two messages from me, one is what you feel, but one is what you hear. You know, you hear something, very nice things, but you feel something different. You always trust your feelings. And I, I suppose for me, where I'm at in my spiritual journey at the moment is I realize that if you change your feelings, you can change the quality of any relationship. I really believe that. Mm. Because often we are innocent. We hold critical and negative thoughts about other people mm. and then we wonder why we don't come close mm. because people feel your thoughts. People feel the energy. It's like a subtle barrier between people. And when I realize that if I keep my mind clean and if I understand how to see good in people, you know, to me, the measure of my ego is seeing fault in other people. That's mm. the best measure. And if I'm always critical, Hmm. That's a measure of how much ego I really have. But if I see virtue and if I have goodwill and good feelings, the karmic effect of that is people will love you. And, you know, 
when you have those feelings with most people, 95% of the time, mm. you will win love from the hearts of people. But that's where people are innocent. Because they hold these negative feelings, mm. then they don't realize that actually they're contributing to the distance in the heart, you know, the negative relationships. What, what are the factors you think can act like a catalyst in helping us, you know, taking the responsibility for our feelings? and uh, giving out only pure positive ones in, in, in spite of how the other person is behaving with us. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's um, a decision you make in life. You know, you can focus on all the negative in people. Um, but I think at one point in my life I realized I really consciously made a decision that everyone has strengths and weakness. You can focus on the weakness and they'll probably focus on yours. Mm. But if you learn to value people, and I've seen it in the Brahma Kumaris, especially amongst a lot of the very experienced yogis, that they love people mm. and they win the love from the hearts of others. And it's a huge power. But I think it comes back to mm. how I see myself and the first relationship in life is with me. And I often feel that if that relationship is dysfunctional, mm. if the way I treat myself is not healthy, I'm not going to treat you in a very healthy way either. You mm. know? So this first relationship, um, I often feel that there's three personalities inside of us, all of us. Mm. The first I call is the, the eye of superiority or the eye of arrogance. It's the facade I present to the world. Mm. And this is the I that thinks I am better, I know more, I am right. But, and this is the I that, I that sees fault in other people. This mm. is the I that always compares yourself with other people. You know, as soon as you meet someone, you compare. Right. But when it comes into my feelings, you know, when, you, when that I is ruling, that's when I easily feel insulted, mm. disrespected, not valued, excluded sensitive. You know, sensitivity is ego. And when that I is ruling my inner world, then it really has a disastrous effect on my relationships. Mm. But that's often a front for the second I, which I often call the vulnerable I, which is the I of inferiority, the ego of inferiority or the lack of self-respect. And that I thinks in the opposite way, thinks I'm not good enough, others are better, others know more. Mm. And when it comes into my feelings, hopelessness, depression, and this is the I that when it's ruling in my th thinking, someone just says something normal to me, like they say, hello, how are you? Why did you speak to me like that for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're feeling low, you mm. interpret everything in the wrong way. Mm. And so we fluctuate and we distort my relationships. And that's why the third I is the I, the, the original self, you know, the soul. And uh, I found personally, the more I've practiced to be an eternal soul and to engage with the other as eternal soul, that's the building blocks of really deep, rich, loving and healthy relationships. So once you've taken this decision to use your third eye, how challenging was it? from your personal experience to actually, you know, um, achieve it, your goal of using your third eye? Well, you know, it's um, because the habit is to see through these mm. eyes and see difference and compare and, you know, it takes time. I, I, I don't think that anyone pretends that spirituality is a quick fix. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> it takes time and practice. Mm. And yet what I've noticed that when you meet somebody and you actually see them as a soul and you don't make all the judgments of the usual mind, you know, are they attractive or unattractive and their background, you know, the mind judges in sec split second, mm. you actually talk to them, they feel comfortable, they feel respected actually, mm. you know, when you see beyond all the conditions mm. and the judgments of the body, you actually connect with someone as a soul and I believe that when you really see someone as a soul, it's the vision of equality. Otherwise, when we think I'm a body, we will see with superiority or inferiority, you know? Quite frankly, usually inferiority, you mm. know? And I feel a little bit inferior to the other. That's the normal human psyche. Mm. And that's not a healthy foundation for a relationship. And I, um, 
I found when I began to practice meditation that to have the vision of brotherhood is such a beautiful thing, but it's a very deep thing and it takes, as we were saying, time <laughs> to practice. So you had to remind yourself, like every instant, every situation you face, you had to remind yourself of this uh, yeah. truth that you found? Yeah, I think so, because the addiction when I forget who I am is to accept sorrow from others, you know. Mm. Sometimes I feel we all have a PhD in accepting <laughs> sorrow. <laughs> you know, we're experts. Mm. We get hurt so easily. And I think if people are honest, we're too fragile, very fragile inside. Um, and that's just, um, it's just, a, it's a lack of spirituality, really. Mm. And when you start to get strong, you, l you stop this habit of um, wanting something from other people and when they don't live up to my expectations mm. just then taking hurt or disrespect and then blaming them you know to me i often feel if i ever find my mind blaming mm. i just know i'm in a i've stepped right out of truth i'm, an, I'm in the world of falsehood and ignorance mm. because it's so much self-deception when i'm you're making my life difficult you're the problem and that's because that's spirituality is the opposite. It's taking full responsibility mm. for who I am and how I feel. Mm. Sort of very common uh, scenario we face is uh, meeting people who are very self-centered, very selfish, and uh, they have their goals in mind, and all they care about is that whether they, uh, you know, defame others in achieving them, or uh, whether they cause uh, trouble or hurt to others. They do not care, but. Uh, Still, uh, if I have to take up this uh, spiritual uh, look at him as a spiritual being and, uh, you know, give those same uh, original uh, pure love and respect for him, uh, I still feel it is a challenge. So, how do I overcome that? <laughs> you know, I feel that um, when people are very self-centered, which is quite common today, it's because they're empty, you know. There's nothing much inside and all they're thinking is what I need. I need your love, I need your respect, I need your support. Mm. So actually, it's, you can almost feel merciful when you see it through a spiritual lens. If you don't <laughs> see it through a spiritual lens, you feel a bit frustrated with them. But, right. but you know, sometimes people are so well educated, they seem so important and yet they're very empty. They're mm. very empty inside. And so I think that, um, when I, I realize that, I can have more of a merciful feeling to mm. them. And um, what I've seen everywhere, that if you give, have a vision of respect, it softens people and people will listen to you. They will respond. To me, I would say the prime thing of a leader today is know how to respect mm. those they're leading. And often they can't do that, you know. A lot of leaders today have Harvard degrees in management and leadership, but they don't know how to get on with people. Mm. They have a lot of intellectual ability, but no emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is nothing more mm. than being able to read people. You know how we do, you can read people through their faces we, and know how to respond to people, make them feel comfortable, make them feel valued and mm. needed. I saw a survey once in Australia, what do people want most in the workplace? And there it was, more than money, they want to be valued, needed, and respected. Hmm. And to me, that's, you know, if we understand that whether I'm a leader in business or in the family or anywhere, if we value and respect people, and even if they're difficult, hmm. how do you change them? Do you change them by correcting them and telling them off? It makes people worse. Because fundamentally, the more ego people have on the surface, it's covering up the lack of self-respect. Hmm. And so the more you correct them, they feel weaker and they get worse. And I think today, okay. hmm. today we just have to really value people. And, and really a huge example in my life was the head of the Brahma Kumaris, Daddy Prakashmini. Hmm. You know, and um, I had the fortune of traveling with her in quite a few countries. And I saw she respected everybody. And because of that, you know, she opened people's hearts and people would listen to her. She was such a wise leader. You mm. know, she would listen and respect people. And then when people 
give her respect, mm. then she can tell them what she needs to tell them. You know, she was brilliant. She was brilliant in understanding how to get on with other people. Mm. And um, another issue that uh, is commonly faced is uh, expectations. Like uh, people expect a lot from you in a relationship, in your profession. Mm. Uh, but I personally feel if when someone expects something good from me, my performance worsens. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why that happens. So uh, how do I say, you know, uh, push that aside, push the expectations aside and just focus on my work? You know, I think the main expectations from ourselves and, you know, I'd say a lot of pressure comes from right. these internal expectations. I have to be this, I have to be that. And I think so much of today's anxiety and stress comes from the pressure I put on myself. And I would say that's more than others put on me. Hmm. You know, when I'm in my self-respect, if others have expectations of me, it doesn't really affect me. But when not, I try to live up to expectations. And I've noticed that people who have a lot of expectations are always disappointed. Hmm. People never live up to their expectations. You know how some people, they're, they're never happy. They're always disappointed in others. And I think, um, I think what I've learned is acceptance of people today. To be very open, I find today people if I can say look very good, but internally aren't very strong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we look good on the surface, but internally there's a lot of things going on. Mm. When they feel loved, accepted and valued, it gives them strength to, right. you know. But when I'm pushing, mm. pushing them and things, actually they feel a lot more fragile and they don't take it in a good way from you. They feel you're, you're pushing a pressure Mm. Your, the pressure of expectations. I mean, I think it's a big thing to take off expectations of myself and accept me as I am is really one of the journeys of spirituality, you know? And that means to be honest with my strengths, but honest with my weaknesses mm. and accept I'm in a process of change. I make mistakes, I have weaknesses, but to be honest about it with myself, I think is a great thing. And I think, um, you know, sometimes the, the pressure we put on ourselves today mm. is so much. And I think, you know, I've read statistics of um, people in general, but especially young people, there's so much pressure to perform right. that they can't sleep and all these sorts of things. Mm. Mm. It's difficult. And what should be your attitude or your feeling for the person who expects from you? Like, how should you look at him? as a soul. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, not to take sorrow from it. I don't think it is an excuse. You know, if we live in our self-respect, we don't accept any disrespect or any expectations, anything from anybody in that way. Because when I'm in my self-respect, I know my own value and whatever people think, whether they're impressed with me or not impressed with me, it doesn't affect how I feel. Hmm. I can remember when I began my meditation journey, I realized early on that I often saw myself through the eyes of others, you know. Hmm. And if others are happy with me, I was happy with me. <laughs> but if they weren't happy with me, I wasn't, you know. Hmm. That's how we've lost our self-respect. And we always look for approval. If you approve of me. So some people go into the workplace with lack of self-respect. They're always seeking approval. Hmm. And if they don't get it, they feel devastated. No. Actually, you do much better when you live in self-respect. Only then can you give love to people, can you give respect to people. And the external expression of genuine self-respect is mm. humility. And really, I think it's fair to say I was once went, visited my dentist in Sydney. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was talking to me and he was saying, these days, you rarely see a humble person, a really genuinely <laughs> humble person. But we love humble people. Actually, they win our love, you know. And if you think it's like egoless, like sometimes you meet very old people and little children, you love them because right. their humility draws a love. But when there's an adult who's, you know, um, maybe a professional person, but they're still genuinely humble, it's very attractive. Hmm. It's very, then, and though sometimes today people read it as weakness. They see, oh, you know. 
someone's humble, but they're not weak at all. They're actually Very strong. strong. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We also see there is an increase in the scale of suicide cases happening uh, around the world now. Uh, so is that uh, like uh, the result of expectations from the family, society? Is, is it because that person is not able to uh, give himself more importance and uh, you know, value his happiness more than the uh, happiness of the others? Is, it th is that the reason why there is such a huge change in this statistics? You know, I think um, it's a lot to do with the culture of the world today. It's so superficial. Life is so superficial. It's more what's important is what's on your business card, hmm. what position you have, which suburb you live in, what car you drive, how much <laughs> money you make. It's so superficial hmm. and it's everywhere. It's an omnipresent culture. But inside, on the surface, people are so good and inside they're just nothing inside, you know. And so therefore, that the the sort of the ego is just inflamed mm. and so little tiny things make them feel so depressed and there's that epidemic of depression which is this um it's like a complete disconnection from my true self in mm. that way so when people lose hope in themselves then they they feel a complete failure and you know often people who commit suicide are people who have big positions and things like that. It's just a message that, to me, like one in four people suffers from clinical depression. If mm. you want my opinion, I think it's even a much more of that. And this is in every country in the world. It's the World Health Organization statistics. It's a sign that the way we live today is so disconnected from truth. And that's where I think it's just that we, if we rebuild a natural spirituality, which is what the Brahma Kumaris are teaching people, not to convert them into anything, but just to re-engage with who I am and a natural spirituality as the foundation, the platform for relationships, for work, for family, for oh. everything. Otherwise, you know, the emptiness, the vacuum inside just increases mm. and um, unfortunately leads to what you were just describing. Mm. So in this discussion today with Brother Charlie, uh, he shared with us many jewels of wisdom that he has gained through his spiritual experiences on how to make our relationships healthier, happier, and uh, something that makes us feel good. We will be uh, continuing this journey with Brother Charlie in the forthcoming episodes on more such interesting and fascinating topics. Hopefully you will join us in them too. Thank you, brother, for joining Thank us. You, Thank, Thank you, Thank you, viewers, for joining us. Have a great day.